geopolitics of the Indo-Pacific and uh, where does India stand? And we have some very, uh, very, very uh, learned uh, people who are going to be talking about it. But let me sort of flag some issues as, as the chair and hopefully the, uh, our, uh, our speakers will be, our party speakers will be talking about some of these and address some of these issues. And in the Q&A, we will have some more interaction. Um, what, I, what I suggest is that uh, once I have finished, all the speakers take about uh, 10 to 12 minutes. Is that all right? Perfectly, sir. 10 to 12 minutes. Sir. Yeah, 30 yeah. minutes for and, discussion. Yeah. And thereafter, later on, we can, uh, after everybody is finished, uh, then we can uh, you know, look at the Q&A. Uh, sure, the, the most significant thing in the Indo-Pacific, to my mind, which has happened in the last uh, uh, decade or so, it has been the rise of China. And it has not been very uh, uh, peaceful, as China keeps saying, peaceful rise of China. And I think, to my mind, it has been a very painful rise of China for the world, very painful for the world. Um, and it has, uh, uh, you know, it started off with the South China Sea, and thereafter it has emerged into the Pacific and now in the entire Indo-Pacific. Uh, one of the reasons that I feel that the, the international order is shaken up a little bit uh, when I say international order shaken up, meaning the, uh, you know, after the after the collapse of the uh, Cold War, uh, U.S. was the you know unipolar uh, sort of uh, hegemon of the world, if you like, uh, meaning that uh, you know the two powers that we are talking about in the geopolitics, one is the economic power and one is the uh, technological complex, the the military power, if you like. Uh, so the uh, America was leading in both the you know both the both the parts. America was number one. Uh, but what has happened in the meantime that economically, uh, China is somewhere there, is just about to catch up the Americans, or I would say that not really just about to catch up, but the gap between the two has reduced so much that it appears that by in next 10, 15 years, uh, China might become the world's most. Uh, uh, sort of what I say, the strongest uh, economic power in the world, leaving the U.S. behind. Uh, that is what it appears. Right now, the gap is still there. As far as military power is concerned, uh, America is miles ahead. And my own sense, having spent many years in the military, 42 years, I feel that China still has a long way to go. Uh, but the trouble is that China thinks uh, because it is economically catching up and likely to overtake the U.S., uh, it has also become a military power, and that is the problem. Uh, when you have uh, from unipolarity, uh, you know, when you have uh, one country being the leader of the economic order and another country being economic, uh, the leader of the military complexes order, uh, then you have a problem. And that is why there is so much of turmoil in the world, uh, each one believing that uh, is superior to the other one. So it starts with the Indian Ocean. Uh, Indo, Indo Pacific, really. So, here there is a competition for supremacy in the Indo Pacific, really. And, and this, is, this is what is actually driving uh, the rest of the fallout. Somebody might ask why it is happening in Ukraine. I can answer that when in QA, I don't want to take too much of time. So, military and economic power disparity uh, leading to turmoil in the world is one issue that I want to say. Second one, is the China-India. When you come to Indian Ocean region, which is one component of the Indo-Pacific, you see Indian Ocean region where India has had a uh, unhindered leadership uh, for centuries, actually speaking. Uh, but now uh, it appears that the, with the entry of China and Pakistan-China nexus, India's strategic space for maneuvering within the Indian Ocean is beginning to shrink. And that is what India thinks that it is, it needs to be restored. And how is China achieving this without fighting a war is the external influences are actually causing India a lot of concern. Number one is the China-Pakistan nexus in the Indian Ocean region. The second one is India-US friendship, which is causing problem to China. And that is why China is reacting in the manner that it is reacting, including Galwan, one of the reasons. And more importantly, China is making inroads into Indian Ocean. They are militarily already here, 
but they have done economic coercion to all india's neighbors and which is actually causing a great uh, uh, concern to india and what you see happening in uh, pakistan what you see happening in uh, sri lanka and uh, possibly in nepal it might happen in future uh, this is only an example of how china is actually squeezing these countries to surrender their sovereignty in a manner and that will not be very good for india so i would say that in the indo pacific these are the geopolitical changes which are taking place why it is happening in ukraine that is mainly the russia china combination and russia getting a sense that the nato is coming on its doorstep that this war is going on china remaining quiet there are two reasons it does not suit china because china's bri the the belt road initiative which is likely to go into eurasia that seems to be in little bit of doldrum and that is where china wanted to push its continental supremacy strategy and that now seems to be in little bit of uh, little bit of hold back so i'll stop here and then i'll invite our uh, in the, the speakers in the same sequence as it is given in the program so let me just see quickly i don't see the name of our first speaker in this one sec Give me a second. I'll just be back in this. Uh, first one is the Shahistan Nishat Ahmed and Jimut Pratim Das. That the first presenters. Yeah, basically, uh, the subject is European Union in the Indo-Pacific uh, need for participation rather than presence. Uh, and uh, PhD candidate, uh, both of them will speak. Shaita and Jimat both. Uh, sir, I will speak. Good morning, sir. Okay, okay. Uh, PhD candidate at the Jawaharlal Nehru University, uh, New Delhi, and the floor is yours. Ten to twelve minutes, ma'am. Um, good morning, Admiral Sena, my fellow panelists and audience members. I hope that everyone is safe and good. I shall be presenting our paper titled "The European Union in the Indo-Pacific: Need for Participation Rather Than Presence." Uh, yeah, we seek to interrogate the path for the EU in the Indo-Pacific, which has seen a move away from the historical presence of the EU towards a more participatory future in the region. The Indo-Pacific has been the subject of much interest to ensure a functional rules-based international order. The EU, which is founded on the principles of organizational interdependence of the economic and strategic fronts, plays a key role in the larger Indo-Pacific due to its new strategic centrality. Because of the larger volume of trade that flows through the region, it has become a coveted location for several world power structures that seek to supplement their ever-growing appetite for influence. Uh, bodies like the Quad and AUKUS are the modern manifestations of larger historical quests to control the dominant narrative of ensuring free, open, and secure sea line. What is of more recent nature is the undeniable rise of China as a global power. Despite the stress which is laid on the common security and foreign policy in the context of Europe, there has been no common understanding to deal with China, as a comprehensive agreement on investment is still pending ratification by the European Parliament. The recent China-EU online summit was aimed to discuss the comprehensive agreement on investment. The counter sanctions, which both had labeled against each other, uh, EU and EU, European Union, the states and the China uh, uh, against each other, and the means of bringing a stop to the Ukrainian crisis. The larger role that India can come to Occupy in the global space due to her convenient geographical positioning forms an important part, uh, important part of the puzzle as well. In a broad thematic uh, structure, the paper seeks to explore as to uh, number one, how to involve, uh, how the involvement of the EU in the Indo-Pacific can be uh, deciphered to be an inclusive exercise because of its foundational principles of institution building and abidance to law and rule with a focus on maritime domain. Two, how the EU Indo-Pacific Strategy document, which was released in September 2021 by the European Union, 
provides a stronger basis of the EU's commitment to the region. Of particular interest in understanding the larger strategy of the EU is the recent AUKUS Pact, which has ushered in, which ushered in an era uh, shrouded in secrecy, strategy, multilateralism, and a rethink of realist ambitions. Number three, <clears throat> sorry, how these initiatives of the EU could be seen as a move away from a mere presence in the Indian Ocean region to a mere, uh, to a more focused involvement, particularly with the rise of China in the area. A thought background of the EU in the Indo-Pacific would be helpful here. The EU strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific was agreed upon by the 27 countries in September 2021, uh, formed its front runners in countries like the Netherlands, France, the United Kingdom, and Germany. The Indo-Pacific is significant because one third of the maritime trade and supply routes of the EU states go through the area, a third of which passes through South China Sea. The earlier areas of concern include piracy, terrorism, unregulated fishing, illicit trafficking in arms, narcotics, and human, and concerns of climate and biodiversity as well. Participating in securing the sea lines of communication in accordance with international law would require the constant presence of national navies that are interested in maintaining their influence in the region. <coughs> However, because the navies of these countries are relatively smaller in size, they would require to coordinate among themselves in the task of capacity building and enhancing the maritime domain awareness in the region. This has manifested as naval exercises and port calls among the partner states, an aspect of becoming increasingly frequent. Furthermore, the EU counter piracy naval force operation, Operation Atlant Atalanta, is uh, situated off the Horn of Africa and later in the Western Indian Ocean. Additionally, uh, additional initiatives such as the Crimario 1 and 2, which are data sharing platforms uh, dedicated towards the Indian Ocean to, and East to South Asian maritime commercial routes, are used to uh, enhance maritime cooperation and coordination. Aside from maritime security, issues such as counterterrorism, non-proliferation, and cybersecurity also form a part of the growing areas of cooperation between European uh, states. The role of the United States of America with the close relationship between the United States and the United Kingdom, especially in the areas of defense and security, has been a coordinated effort to engage with common areas of interest. Post-Brexit, the continued close proximity of the US and UK calls for the EU, EU to work closely with the United Kingdom in securing the goals mentioned in the EU strategy document. The Quad is a, a kind of supply chain security initiative from a European point of view as, and has yet to attain a more formal character. The La Peraus war game and the Malabar naval exercises are certain instances of such endeavors of the Quad countries and the partner states in the Indian Ocean region and the maritime vicinity of the Indian littoral waters. Hence, the involvement of the EU in the Indo-Pacific would also be instrumental to ensure the free and secure sea lines of commerce in accordance with the UNCLOS. This further adds to the factor of trust and stability in the Quad grouping among the members and its strategic partners. The individual bilateral treaties among the Quad countries and EU stakeholders would help in building a more connected and secure Indo-Pacific. The recent withdrawal of the United States from Afghanistan has hit its extended debt credibility, and in these circumstances, the significant future principles of rule of law plays as a fundamental value for the European Union as to the trustworthiness of its role as a strategic partner in the region. Uh, the major economic and strategic interest roads the EU sea commerce uh, for the EU sea commerce are the Babele Mandav Strait, the Malacca Strait, and in the South China Sea. As the EU is a non-binding institution, it is uh, unlikely to form a military alliance in the Indo-Pacific region, keeping, and keeping China at bay has necessitated a tilt in the policy that favors India. The EU-India leaders meeting held on May 8, 2021, zeroed in on the areas of shared understanding of the rule of law, democracy, human rights, technology, and such strategic areas of cooperation. Uh, the BIMSTEC is, is also identified as well as one initiative to promote core uh, connectivity in the area. Other such areas which are, uh, which are in the catalog for further joint involvement include the trade and investment, EU-India and connecti EU -India connectivity partnership, uh, with digital transport, people to people, or energy, which are sustainable in nature, climate and health preparedness and multi-sectoral cooperations. Uh, additionally, the EU has identified uh, non-traditional areas of work with its partner countries. The EU offers and the participatory future. Uh, in the following section, we seek to explore as to how the recent office pact can be seen as a signaling a more involved and participatory future for the EU in the Indo-Pacific, in the Indo-Pacific. It was primarily targeted to meet the security challenges in the Indo-Pacific region and attain credibility militarily against, the China, against China in the Indo-Pacific. Australia drafted the AUKUS deal uh, with, the, uh, U, uh, with the US and the United Kingdom after scraping the Australia-France conventionally powered company deal of 2016. 
where the you know the, where the European Union is focused on working on holistic security aspects, the AUKUS is intended to be a more of a balance of power security alliance. After the commencement of the AUKUS Pact, it was announced that Australia has committed to providing logistical and infrastructural support of two United States military forces and infrastructure in Australia and other US military bases in the Indo-Pacific. This was central to maintaining a credible balance against China, which has made extensive territorial claims in the Indo-Pacific region. Australia ties with the United States have grown closer with the initiation of the Blue Dot Network along with Japan, which was proposed as a counter to the BRI. Uh, in the case of the United States, the reiteration regarding the pivot to Asia policy by the Obama administration and the Trump administration stress on free and open in the Pacific has set the course for the shift in focus of, uh, in the region. The post-pandemic fallout of the respective relations with China has further strengthened the case for United States and um, Australia coming, towards, uh, coming to strategically balance China in the region to protect their mutual economic and strategic interests. In the case of United Kingdom, the post-Brexit foreign policy intended to pursue an uh, autonomous strategic, uh, an autonomous uh, uh, strategic direction, concentrating on the Indo-Pacific, as is outlined in the Integrated Review of the United Kingdom in 2021. Additionally, this alliance also reiterated the position of the United Kingdom as a core member of the NATO alliance and its maritime strategy in the Indo-Pacific. The reaction of the European Union with regard to AUKUS deal could be assessed through the lens of the United States, uh, through, of the you know, European Union as an organization and the reaction of its individual countries. The conduct leading up to the pact and the ensuing, secret, um, ensuing secrecy was projected as one leading to distrust between European, member, European Union members who perceived the US as a close security ally of the region. Of particular interest is the role of France within the wider EU strategy of the IOR. IOR. Uh, France as an uh, Indo-Pacific maritime state has formulated close connections with the states in the Indo-Pacific region. Through arms cooperation and hence information sharing or joint maritime exercises, France also actively engages with the allied countries in the region. The <coughs> Paris Delhi, <coughs> the Paris Delhi Canberra access in 2018 and the close relations that France fosters with India and Japan depict the uh, active participation of France in the maritime security aspect of the Indo-Pacific, regardless of any summary deal. Being a major uh, naval power in the European Union. Uh, France also recognizes the need to maintain the freedom of navigation and uh, passage of commerce, particularly against the threat of China to control the global commerce. Despite the surprise disclosure of the August Pact and the subsequent international drawbacks to the pact, the EU has maintained its resolve to continue the maritime security initiatives. The EU's defense and security deployments remain restricted to, particular, uh, to participation under the NATO umbrella and the, subsequent, and the sustained presence in the Western Indian Ocean, I mean the Western Indian Ocean region. Uh, the capacity to extend this uh, to the wider Indo-Pacific region is limited, and the bulk of naval deployments of the region uh, to the region may be taken up uh, taken up only by France. Europe needs to harness the maritime capability of the French Navy to further its ambition in the Indo-Pacific. France is one of the four countries which is uh, with a national Indo-Pacific strategy, along with Germany, then the Netherlands, and the United Kingdom. The France, uh, the French Defense Minister Florence Parley visited India in the third week of December 2021 and reiterated the importance of uh, ensuring a, security, a, a secure global supply chain, uh, multilateral rules based order, and tackling climate change issues. Likewise, she spoke about the significance of dispute settlement through arbitration rather than force and emphasized the respect for global commons. <clears throat> the main interest of the EU has remained the security and stability in the Indian Ocean region, where its primary role is that of a security provider to protect the sea lines of communication for free trade and order. As France and has national territories in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, it is considered as a resident power. The AUKUS Pact uh, disregards this influence of the France and the EU in the Indo-Pacific region. This could be garnered from the timing of the announcement of the AUKUS Pact a day before the declaration of the EU Indo-Pacific strategy on 16 September 2021. The renewed demand for European strategic autonomy has, has thus gained uh, widely recently with France and Portugal as the, in the forefront of the call. Germany being a military ever state was not in the support of this call for strategic and military autonomy of the EU. Nevertheless, the EU has been quick to call for a balance in the response to the offer security pact as the United States is a critical security uh, ally uh, concerning the NATO. In addition, the United Kingdom itself is a partner in NATO uh, the EU does not hence uh, intend to undermine the domain of the NATO or jeopardize its relationship with the US, which is a primary security partner of the European Union. The EU and Indo-Pacific, uh, uh, the EU and India, multiple pathways and realist ambitions. 
we will now move on to look at the EU India relations. Over the years, the European Union has steadily engaged with India and has held uh, and recently has held the first uh, maritime security dialogue uh, in the virtual format on the 20th January 2021. The intent was to and the intent was to contribute the uh, to the strategic partnership between the two ent entities along the India EU roadmap to 2025. The second India-EU maritime security dialogue was also conducted virtually on 1st February 2022, where the EU strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific and India's Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative, IPOI, were discussed. Other issues which were deliberated upon included capacity building exercises to combine naval, naval exercises, such as the one conducted in the Gulf of Aden in June 2021, and maritime domain awareness initiatives. The EU held the Ministerial Forum for Cooperation in the Indo-Pacific on 22nd February 2022. This witnessed the participation of foreign ministers of European Union member states and states from the Indo-Pacific. Uh, the, Indian, uh, the Indian External Affairs Minister Dr. S. Jashankar reiterated the commitment of India through the many, military, uh, many multilateral and bilateral efforts that has uh, been undertaken in the Indian Ocean region, such as the IPOI and the Quad. The presence of India as a member country in the Quad is both a necessity and an acknowledgement of China's growing feature in the world order. Being the most geographically proximate neighbor under the uh, uh, being the most geographically proximate neighbor uh, under the uh, current geographical uh, current geographical and security circumstances, the Indian state must keep its own interest foremost to see through the complete uh, the completion of the um, uh, Rafael deal is merely the beginning of strengthening India relations with the powerful EU members. The reactions of China, <coughs> the reaction of China has not been supportive of the August Pact to play the lead. Uh, China has raised concerns for the initiation of another arms race and found similar concerns echoed by Indonesia and Malaysia, uh, who fear the increasing nuclear, uh, nuclear presence in the region. Conversely, other countries such as Vietnam, Japan, Philippines, uh, and Taiwan have in fact welcomed the conclusion uh, of the trilateral pact. Of particular interest is the path uh, uh, shown by Malaysia, which is, uh, which is playing uh, in Malaysia, which is uh, uh, particularly in the part shown by Malaysia, which is playing a delicate balancing act. After voicing apprehensions about the AUKUS pact, Malaysia has uh, approached France for a military deal to counter China, the same power that the AUKUS itself was formed to counter. It shows that the country's own international interests must determine its policy futures, again encapsulated in India's strategic relations with Russia, and uh, India hence must therefore temper her foreign policy with a more reflective structure that takes into account both geography and realism. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much. I think that was a uh, uh, lot of things compressed in a very short time. I wish you had a little longer. Uh, uh, all the points that you have made is very relevant. And I, I, I just want to uh, make a couple of uh, observations on this. Now, first is that uh, uh, the capability of EU uh, per se, uh, apart from France, uh, to be present militarily uh, or even have very, uh, shall I say, very large uh, trade uh, with countries in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, in the Pacific, yes, but in the Indian Ocean region right now is uh, still not to its full potential. And I think it's going to take some time. And one of the reasons why the European Union will be interested in seeing uh, peace and stability is primarily for their business to progress well. Uh, otherwise, militarily, as you rightly said, EU is not a military alliance, and it is unlikely to be because of the protection of the NATO. Very, very uh, sort of good observation there. Uh, but you know, France has got its uh, interest. France is a resident country as far as the Indo-Pacific is concerned. They've got more, all, I think, ten protectorates in this area, or maybe more, and therefore. The India-France bilateral, which exercise Varuna has just taken place. Yes. And you mentioned one very important point that the axis of uh, Delhi, Paris and uh, Canberra, Australia, uh, this can really uh, be a very important part of the uh, Indo-Pacific military power. Uh, and not so much uh, other countries because their commitment will be less. The second point that I want to, observation that I have is, uh, you know, the interest of United Kingdom after the Brexit, um, you know, we are on the verge of uh, 
uh, you know, concluding uh, almost an FTA, not of all items, but certain items, just like we are having with Australia. Um, and that will have the interest of the, the UK uh, back into the Indian Ocean region. Uh, and, and, you know, in the periods of colonization, they have a ease of, uh, shall I say, interacting with people, the language they have left behind. All of us speak the same language, virtually all countries. So there he has an advantage. But I would, I would uh, see, uh, you know, as only an observer, you, you people are doing research work. But as an observer, I feel that, you know, the, uh, the EU and uh, the UK, uh, they will probably be taking advantage of their soft power to keep their influence going in the Indo-Pacific region, to my mind. Uh, because on hard power, uh, even the UK is quite far away, uh, you know, from uh, you know from what they should have uh, for having any effective uh, opposition or resistance to China. It is not easy to sort of you know uh, resist China right now, and the only country which can take on China in is the US very much. Uh, US, UK, and Australia, the AUKUS which has been formed, they are quite a formidable force, particularly in the Pacific Ocean. And very much because of our geographical advantage, uh, India in the Indian Ocean region and Europe. So broadly, I will uh, put it there. And maybe during your research, you can, and you may like to include as to how much is EU going to be inclined after they being so unhappy about India's position that India has taken in, uh, in the Ukraine-Russia war. However, the second point is that there is a lot of divergence between the US and the European Union as far as the sanction on Russia is concerned. So that also is one of the reasons of a, a little bit of, shall I say, uh, not completely on board with the US on particular thing. So these are few points which you may consider uh, doing a little bit of study in your uh, research and see where it leads you to drawing the conclusions as far as European Union in the Indo-Pacific is concerned. So that is, that is what I have to say. So thank you. That was really very, uh, very nicely done. And uh, I appreciate uh, the work you have done. Now, may I invite uh, Mr. Syriac uh, Pampakal uh, on, he's a research scholar at the uh, university, the Mahatma Gandhi. Is that Mahatma Gandhi uh, University in Kottaya? Yes, sir, it is. Okay. Uh, and he is going to be talking about India shifting interest and policies in the Indo-Pacific, a strategy or an uh, exigent uh, requisite. Uh, very interesting, and I would be very interested to hear what your, what your uh, research actually says. Because this is an area of uh, interest to most of us who are students of, uh, uh, shall I say, Indo-Pacific strategy and Indo-Pacific, what happens here because it's our home. Uh, so I'll be very interested to hear. Go ahead, floor is yours. Uh, thank you, sir. Um... And uh, as the chair has already mentioned, my uh, topic is India's shifting interests and policies in the Indo-Pacific uh, strategy on ex ex uh, exigent requisite. And um, due to the limitation of time, I would be focusing my paper on two, uh, two fundamentals, like the, um, the lack of consensus in the nature of the construct of Indo-Pacific and as well as the dual nature of India's engagements in the region. And when we talk about uh, Indo-Pacific, uh, for the beginning, uh, Indo-Pacific is often interpreted as a as a culmination or a, an expansion of uh, or a, uh, or the culmination of two contiguous waters of Indo Indian Ocean and uh, Indo, Indo uh, and Pacific Ocean. But um, as we all know, the term uh, Indo-Pacific is of Western origin, and, and um, the U.S. interpretation of the region is quite different from that of uh, what our country have envisioned so far. And when we talk about uh, uh, maritime uh, India's maritime policy, uh, it is tilting towards eastwards, as most of uh, uh, of its proposed partnerships and animosities hails from the east. This is primarily regarding the U.S.-led groups and PRC, respectively. As uh, Pacific is a friend of contestation between the U.S. and its allies, and PRC is making a relative concern to Indian interests as well as in the Himalayas. This is fundamentally associated with the Indian effort to reciprocate the growing PRC interference in its neighborhood. 
uh, as we have mentioned, what mm, they've been doing in Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Nepal, etc., are of great concerns for India. While the Indian effort to extend its reach to the Pacific to counter the Chinese, a similar stratagem is already uh, placed in the neighborhood by the US and its allies. And this makes two anti-Chinese stratagems to overlap and find an alignment. And uh, this overlap and intersection promoted the invention and con invention of the concept of the culminated geopolitical space called Indo-Pacific. At least this is the US interpretation of what they need in the, in the region of Indo-Pacific, as India as a, as a regional attendant towards the US interest, uh, as in the, uh, in the sake of uh, countering China uh, against Indian interests. And uh, while this construct of uh, this nature of cons uh, the construct of Indo-Pacific is, is of Western-centric and extra-regional in nature, and this makes uh, it difficult to cultivate a sense of uniformity or and a certainty regarding the most of the fundamentals of Indo-Pacific. For instance, uh, the discontent and lack of consensus in establishing the geographical boundaries of the region itself is uh, because of its foreign uh, origin of the concept. Uh, this extra regionality in the fundamentals comes in direct conflict uh, with the interests of most of the uh, regional stakeholders, and it makes us difficult to even to the phrase of evolutionary part of the concept. The Western, uh, the US scripted concept of uh, Indo Pacific can be de uh, depicted as an involved stage or an updated form of uh, an already existing geopolitical infrastructure, which is known as the Asia Pacific which can be perceived as a culmination of both the shores of uh, Pacific Ocean. But now the interpretation is largely founded by the US ploy to expand the theater of contestation to limit the spread of uh, out, uh, spread out ability of its adversaries, particularly China. Further, this interpretation antagonizes the US adversaries in the region. And um, you can see the US have already uh, renamed, uh, reshifted its uh, theater commands from a US specific viewpoint to an inter-Pacific viewpoint. Uh, but um, when we talk about uh, India's vision about Indo-Pacific, the concept of Indo-Pacific uh, Indo can be interpreted in a different way and in, in a more inclusive way uh, as a geopolitical platform for connectivity and trans-regional cooperation. Uh, this, is, this defines the region as a culmination of interest parties rather than an extended form of an in existing infrastructure. Uh, this will elude the discontent from U.S. adversaries as uh, the, in the U.S. version, uh, it's uh, it's somewhat centered on the Western Pacific, particularly on uh, South China Sea, where the active contestation between the United States and the China is going on, and uh, this will hamper the growth and um, the growth of um, in the Pacific as a cooperative platform. Uh, such an equitable uh, depiction about the nature of the Pacific concept may seem a prospective one uh, in the beginning, but it will uh, hamper um, uh, the integration of the region in its entirety, because in the Pacific, uh, according to Indian view, is somewhat uh, bigger, too big, uh, like two big oceans with two thirds of the world's population, almost 60% of world's trade and five continents. That is too big to be, um, to be integrated into one single construct. So uh, in that uh, in that manner, it, it it is starkly starkly different from what of what the U.S. Uh, is envisioning as a security construct. Uh, you, the U.S. Um, uh, viewpoint about the Indo-Pacific is limited is limited towards uh, the security perspectives. Uh, it ha uh, it has the perspective is too limited, while the Indian um, vision is somewhat bigger than a uh, mere uh, reactionary strategy. Or, a, uh, or as a requisite. But India is a uh, proactive st uh, uh, proactive stance in the region. For instance, India has been a strong advocate for a free and open in the Pacific. Uh, the United States, Australia, the ASEAN nations have all stated that India should play a bigger role, but on, only on the terms of, uh, but India's vision is we play a bigger role, but not only on our terms. For instance, we can uh, take the recent episode, a, a recent chapter of Indo India's Indo-Pacific engagements, uh, India's uh, agreements with uh, recent agreements with Australia, uh, showing the Indo-Pacific is more than that. Uh, some strategic concerns or a some security point of view. Uh, India's commerce, um, India's uh, engagement in the Indo-Pacific is fun, uh, founded on three elements like openness, connectivity and ASEAN centrality. While the US vision is centered on Western Pacific, uh, at a theater of contestation, the India's um, view of Indo-Pacific 
is more peaceful, more centered on more uh, on a cooperative pat platform, which is, uh, as we all know, has seen as a very cooperative, very uh, progressive, and very economically um, prospective region. And um, for its part, India sees the Indo-Pacific as a geographical as well as a, an economic expanse, with 10 ASEAN countries serving as a link between two big oceans. And India's vision of the Indo-Pacific is built on uh, inclusiveness, openness, and um, unity. And connect trans-regional connectivity is the centrality of India's uh, Indo-Pacific engagement. And moreover, uh, India's commerce in this region is also quickly expanding with international investments focusing on the East as seen by the comprehensive economic partnership agreements with, uh, with Japan, uh, South Korea and Singapore, as well as the ASEAN uh, and Thailand, uh, especially the comprehensive economic trade agreements, uh, free trade agreements with all these countries. Uh, the growing active policies exemplifies India's approach to the region which includes economic involvement uh, with Southeast Asia as well as strategic cooperation with East Asia, New Zealand, and other oceanic uh, countries. And India doesn't con does not consider Indo-Pacific as a region to be a strategy or a club with few members, few number of members. India's concept of Indo-Pacific, as, uh, as I have mentioned earlier, is from the shores of Africa to the shores of, uh, not to the shores of the Americas, not just the North American continent, but also the South American. The South American uh, shows are always neglected when we discuss about uh, Indo-Pacific. That is uh, that is a viewpoint which is more inclusive. Uh, room, uh, obviously, room for more, more, but not just uh, room for the uh, friendly countries or partner countries, but even for the uh, possible adversaries China. China. India strongly uh, disregard the idea of an Indo-Pacific excluding China. India wants uh, China to be in as a uh, as a uh, as creating an orderly uh, low based orderly uh, Indo-Pacific where every member states behave um, with uh, with regard to international rules. And that is India's um, uh, proactive step towards a strategy rather than uh, uh, seeing the construct of Indo-Pacific as a um, as a uh, mere requisite uh, exigence uh, requisite. And moreover, uh, um, India India's vision creates a problem of um, the nature of Indo-Pacific to become too big. Uh, India do have a strategy to uh, to uh, to counter that argument. Whether um, India like to engage the region in uh, many many lateral uh, agreements, which um, with uh, 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 when we say about India Australia Japan uh, partnerships, India US Japan, India uh, Australia Indonesia uh, partnership, India has that kind of vision rather than um, making a uh, um, single uh, construct, making uh, several platforms of cooperation, where finding likely partners to make room for more cooperation rather than creating a uh, uh, a single construct with um, too many members cobbling over uh, different uh, and petty differences, etc. And uh, that uh, shows uh, India have evolved its Indo-Pacific policy uh, from an existence uh, requisite to a proactive strategy serving its own interests rather than being a pawn in the bigger game. And thank you. I think that's, uh, uh, to my mind, it's an extremely good assessment of what uh, what is going on. Uh, two, three things which I want to uh, flag, which I which I think that the uh, good job that you are doing, and I'm sure that you may like to do some more. One, uh, the last point that you made, that India would like to have several platforms rather than having one platform and making a mess of the entire thing, because there will be too many interests of various people. Uh, and India would like to work on a sole interest of its own Indian interest. Uh, but now, uh, having said that, is that is that desirable uh, for a emerging power? Uh, is that desirable for a regional power uh, that you only look at your interest and you don't take uh, don't uh, cater for interest of others who are in the group? So that is one area you may like to. I have no answer to this really, but you may like to have a look at it. For example. Uh, India has woken up to BIMSTEC. 
and you see the amount of support that india is now beginning to give to sri lanka despite the fact that sri lankans are very close to the chinese and a lot of people say that a lot of their trouble is actually because of the you know uh, uh, the debt trap which the chinese have mainly the chinese have created uh, so india has woken up india is also helping nepal and once one is beginning to see that nepal with the present prime minister a slight movement towards uh, uh, you know uh, more understanding that india is more important to them which is you know which is doing so much but we are also to be blamed india is also to be blamed because what we promise and we don't do it in time that is one big uh, complaint that everybody has but i think uh, having said that of late in last 3 4 5 years there has been good progress i have been visiting these countries and uh, i feel that there is a, a fair amount of uh, progress there uh, then one more point that you made and let me just quickly go back to this um, indo pacific being too big uh, for you know any these three four nations to be i fully support this view uh, in fact um, uh, my own very uh, sort of understanding as a practitioner is Uh, that indo-pacific must be seen in three sections uh, one very much is the pacific the western pacific one is very much the eastern pacific and the south china sea which is contiguous to each other and third one is the indian ocean region and i believe that uh, uh, the quad which is formed it is a very good example as to how three middle powers are part of the squad in indian ocean region india in the south china sea japan and possibly indonesia at a later day and australia in the in the western pacific and us being omnipresent in all this giving you a backup and i think all these countries are really uh, and now that the aukus has come into being uh, with you know uh, us and and australia and and uk uh, it has added to the australia slightly weak navy why i say weak navy uh you know because their submarine force uh because they didn't have any big sort of uh, security threat uh, the navy was on a sort of way down but now with the nuclear submarine coming and the ship building being given fair amount of impetus by both by the americans and the british i think that uh, you know australia will become a very formidable and a lot of people have been talking about aukus you know that uh, you know is it complementary or is it adverse to what but i think that's a quad is a very different subject you know maybe we can uh, we can have a discussion at a later date if the university so wants uh, so thank you very much these are the points that i thought i will just share with you uh, now let me invite our next speaker you know i'm having great difficulty in opening this time in again <laughs> sir is a sinu Yes, Kunjumon, yes, yeah. So is there Sinu? Kunjumon. Yeah, yes, but let let me get the name right. <laughs> oh yeah, sure. Let me get the name right. I must get the name right because uh, it's not good to be chairing a session and not able to. Sinu Kunjumon, is that right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's Sinu. Okay, Sinu. It's Sinu Kunjumon. Right. Kunjumon, that's correct. uh she is a research scholar at the university of uh, uh, kerala which campus is this karaitiwan what what kariwattam oh, kariwattam uh, campus. campus which is in trivandrum yeah. tiruvanthapuram okay so yes, you are going to be yes, talking sir. in the india's role in the new geopolitics of the indo pacific i am so happy to see all these yes. sessions because these are the subjects that i have been you know sort of mucking my head for last so many years talking here writing uh, so it's really a, it's big education to me as well as to what the researchers found in fact i might get in touch with them in future to improve my own uh, <laughs> research work because you people are doing independently in this so thank you very much all yours uh, uh, sino please go ahead yes yeah, sir so before my, i start my presentation i will share a screen So, so, respect to Shail, co-leaders, and all the listeners, a very good morning. 
So today I'm going to present on the topic India's role in the new geopolitics of Indo-Pacific. So the whole presentation revolves around uh, five keywords that is India, new geopolitics, Indo-Pacific, balance, and security. So the topic is something based on the good factor. What are the role? What are the role India could play in the new geopolitics of the Indo-Pacific? So uh, to cope with the dynamics of power shift happening on the Indo-Pacific. So before looking into what are the role India could play. Uh, it's important to know the background or uh, it's important to know, know the background new geopolitics in the Indo-Pacific. So uh, Indo-Pacific become the buzzword of international politics due to the economic, strategic, and political importance of the region. And everyone knows that there's a lot of geopolitical developments happening on the Indo-Pacific. And first and foremost among it is the rise of an assertive China. See, the strategic turmoil happening on the Indo-Pacific is in tandem with the rise of an assertive China. And almost all other region in the all other regional countries in the Indo-Pacific is feeling the uh, heat of this assertiveness of China for taking the instance of Indian friend and colonial friend, India is facing, you know, India is feeling the heat of that assertiveness from the China. So that is the one thing. And the second thing is the relative decline of power statue, of US power statue. See, uh, as the economic and political power shift from, uh, you know, west to east, there's a, uh, actually Washington is struggling to maintain its hegemony in the region. So as per the Lobby Institute Power Index in 2020, uh, even though US remains as the largest power in the end of uh, the year 2020 has shown that there's a largest decline in the relative power of US. Uh, when compared to all other countries in the Indo-Pacific region. So that is another geopolitical development in the Indo-Pacific. And another third one is uh, India at the strategic high table. See, there's a widespread conviction that the rise of this Indo-Pacific geographical construct is a recognition to what? Uh, is in a recognition to the India's growing importance in the region. So India is economically, politically, diplomatically, uh, with all of the regional countries, uh, participating in multilateral, multilateral, bilateral organizations, all those things. So India is totally, is, you know, this geographical construct is in a way recognition to India's increasing role in the region. Another one is increasing role of other regional powers, especially when you look at Australia. For example, uh, we know that India and Australia doesn't share that much relationship in the past, but in the 2020, the year 2020 marked an upgradation to the relationship between India and Australia. They upgraded the relationship to partnership, and now they signed a trade pact. And South Korea came out with an Indo-Pacific strategy. Indonesia is projecting the Samaritan power of the Indo-Pacific, all those things. And the foremost development, the foremost geopolitical development in the Indo-Pacific is obviously the great power rivalry between uh, US and China. Uh, from the ideological friend to the technological friend, they both are competing to hold their feet in the Indo-Pacific. So these are the geopolitical developments happening in the Indo-Pacific. So against this background, uh, India how to play its, you know, India how to play its role in the Indo-Pacific. So before looking at the role, there are some factors that calls India to have a natural role in the Indo-Pacific. The first and foremost thing is obviously the geography. Pacific is a geographical construct rather than a regional organization. So, of course, there's the geographical features of a country have a great influence in the strategic calculus of the Indo-Pacific. So, given the geographical fact features of India, like uh, like you know, flanking Indian Ocean from the northern side, sitting astride sea lanes of communication, uh, sitting aside the important maritime chalk points, having borders with uh, key players of Indo-Pacific, India. Uh, the geographical features, you know, call India to have a natural role in the Indo-Pacific. That's the first point. And, and the second thing, obviously, the ability of India to have a role in the Indo-Pacific. There's the economic, military, political diplomacy. Having, uh, you know, one of the, uh, one of the largest, you know, not one of the largest, largest democracy in the region. India have ties with almost all the countries in the region. That and this might not shows that India have the capacity to play a role in the Indo-Pacific and participation as multilateral, minilateral, and bilateral platforms. Uh, Sinu, can uh, I just stop you for in a region? Sinu, can, I, uh, which has, Sinu, can I stop you for a minute? Yes, yeah, sir. What, what you can do is okay, you can uh, you can uh, you know close your video 
so that you can get a little more bandwidth and you don't get interrupted in sound you know you can you can uh, yeah you can stop your video and run only on the audio hello go ahead perfect we can hear you okay okay yeah so uh, the another thing is everyone knows that indo pacific is a region uh, which have lot of this multilateral minilateral and bilateral bilateral life for mekong ganga cooperation uh, indian ocean naval symposium the minilateral like squad all those things are there so in all this platforms india already have shown its participation or spearheaded some of the organizations so through these platforms india it's uh, easy for india to leverage its mightiness so that's another thing then engagement with key states india already have you know share relation with almost all the countries in the region especially with the us or china or whatever the countries so that's these all are the factors that calls india to have a natural role in the indo pacific so what are the role india in the pacific and some of these roles are india is already playing in the indo pacific so india is supposed to play a significant role in the indo pacific the first and foremost role india can have play you know india could play in the indo pacific as a champion of multilateralism see uh, the the template of multilateralism is is a known thing to india especially you know in in the indo pacific india india bases itself to the idea of collective security without building any military alliances at the same time india is also india's vision for the indo pacific is premised upon asean centrality um support of values like openness freedom inclusiveness so all these things uh, you know uh, urge india to have a multilateral uh, to be a champion of the multilateralism in the indo pacific and the, and the second role india can play it's already playing Uh, india can play in the indo pacific is the net as a net security provider and a net security and a security guarantor of the indo pacific it's uh, it's a part india is already playing with the island countries and uh, given the economic and political you know uh, given the economic and mil capabilities new delhi have engendered with uh, engendered to have greater responsibility in the manage of management of regional security uh particularly uh, in its immediate vicinity given the geographical features like sitting as right uh, important sea lines of communication or maritime choke points india have the role to play you know safeguard all these things and uh, in the foremost thing the most recently the vaccine diplomacy played by india to secure the health security of all other all the especially the island countries in the indo pacific shown that have the capacity to play a net security provider of the region so that's another thing then the and the third role india could play in the indo pacific as a potential regional balancer against china you see uh, i yeah, it's 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 actually a good fact you know it's a good uh, okay then the recently declassified us strategy framework on indo pacific uh, sees india as a you know potential regional balancer against china and uh, politically and economically india is a strong candidate to balance against china see if you look at uh, economically from a macroeconomic standpoint uh, india has a billion population a growing middle class and it's lot of economic liberalization happening on the region it's opening up its economy totally so all those things and from the political standpoint see india is uh, a country which is a vocal critic of china from bri to rcep it's publicly criticized or oh, publicly raised its concern about all these projects then and even though uh, when all of the countries are trying to decouple its economy with china india is the one country who took baby steps you know baby steps to uh, create an indo pacific where china is no no dominating so in all this case so all these things shows that india have the capacity to become a regional balancer against china and forging a middle power coalition that's another role india could play in the indo pacific see middle power coalition it's another area of discussion but what is a middle power uh, middle power is uh, not so great power and in between so middle power coalition is uh, india have the capacity to harness the shared interests 
or shared concerns uh, with other middle powers that is like australia or the south korea or indonesia because all these countries have their own shared concerns like the rise of china is obviously in a shared concern of these countries so the india can harness all these shared interests or shared concern and uh, can create a coalition against um, you know it's not against actually it's like an an alternative because see if a full blown great power comes into play in the indo pacific uh, the great power rivalry they they have because all these countries in the indo pacific have either relation either related to us or china so they are not in a position to choose between us and china so there should be an alternative way so i suggest that india have the india have the capacity to form a middle power coalition in the another thing then why would india should play this roles in the pacific is something uh, according to my observation see obviously indo pacific is the hardest reality hello am i audible hello yes yes you are audible but in between you are sort of uh... Uh, is your is your uh, video stopped go ahead silo you go ahead i think she got disconnected sir acha shall we wait i'm so sorry sir oh, internet internet connection is not stable that's why i'm so sorry yeah you can you can put your video off so that you know we can uh, your okay. audio will yeah okay sir so uh, yeah so uh, why would india play how to play this role the first and foremost thing is uh, it's a you know indo pacific is the hardest reality three See, if you have, if india want to have a say or you know have to how to stand out in this geopolitics india have to take its own part its own role to play in the indo pacific so every country in the indo pacific have in trying to hold their presence in the indo pacific so if india want to stand out in this multilateral world india have to carve out its own space so all these roles help india to have a space or have a say in the new geopolitics of the indo pacific and obviously the for ensuring it's a great power rivalry already i told that if something you know uh, if any uh, if any great power rivalry totally blown out in the indo pacific in the have uh, both these countries so that's another thing and the, the third most thing is the indira doctrine according to the indira doctrine uh, the prosperity and security of india is totally connected to the regional security so if we, india want to become in a safe and secure uh, obviously it have to create a favorable environment uh, in its near so through this roles india can to an extent ensure a favorable environment in the indo pacific and the la- oh, and the last thing is its great power ambition india always ambitions to become a great power in the region not in the region and in the world also so all these roles help india to become a great power in the region and uh, the last one is uh, the you know it's like a way forward Uh, what you know what all india can do become the great power or a, become a major power in the indo pacific the obviously india have to come out with a national security strategy for indo pacific uh, which addressing challenges of the indo pacific because in the indo pacific india is facing not just traditional uh, challenges both traditional non security challenges so addressing both these challenges india have to come out with a national security strategy for the indo pacific and second thing is see it's not possible to have a one size fit all approach is not possible in the indo pacific because west asia is different from the east asia east asia is different from the island countries so india how to you know address the development needs and interest of particular area and how to come out with its own approach to address you know the development needs and interest of these countries and of course even uh, india how to you know forge and strengthen its relation with all other countries in the indo pacific and at the same time it have to keep in mind that it should not lose its 
strategic autonomy uh, do not fall into the strategic ambit of other countries in the region that's under the flood and the last and foremost thing uh, through constructive and determined focus of course india can become it is power in the region so that's all about that's all my presentation thank well, you thank you sino i think it took uh, much longer than i thought it will and that will have to cut down the timing of uh, smriti shukla um, you know since france you are talking about france alone i'll give you exactly 5 minutes to talk <laughs> sorry about that but you know we are really running out of time uh, good morning all of you the topic of my presentation is the study of role of france in indian ocean i have divided my presentation in six sub topics now starting with the introduction i have given a brief detail about indian ocean and its historical relevance its historical relevance has been cited by timothy dual and dennis rumley which has said that it is expected to bear half of world's population by 2050 the scenario is changing in 21st century as robert kaplan in his work monsoon the indian ocean and future of american power has asserted that indian ocean is to be become cockpit of future maritime rivalries which has led to the presence of multipolar actor the next subheading is india in western indian ocean region here i have cited here i have confined india's policy in western indian ocean region before that i would like to introduce what constitutes western indian ocean region it consists majorly of madagascar mauritius seychelles comoros reunion island and maiote india's maritime policy took started to took shape in 1970s and 1980s but it was in 21st century when it became a full fledged maritime policy with which also led to the publishing of india's indian maritime doctrine in 2007 india's naval cooperation with Mar Russia's Seychelles Comoros started in 1971, which is reflected in the form of various initiatives like Supreme Building construction of Supreme Court Building, ENT Hospital in Mauritius, from uh, and joint patrolling with Mauritius Coast Guard ships also. The efforts are also visible in maritime cooperation in the form of defence maritime agreement with Seychelles, Madagascar, and Comoros. The another policy that India follows in Western Indian Ocean region is of net security provider. In this net security provider policy is defined in India's revised maritime doctrine 2015, ensuring securing seas. India's maritime security strategy, which define it as a concept comprehensively covering security, balancing threats, and countering all risks and challenges. In terms of regional framework, India is also associated with Indian Ocean Rim Association. Uh, Smriti, Ocean. Smriti, can I request you to come down only to what is the French role that you envisage? Uh, Just uh, come down to the yeah. Okay, so yeah. France and Indian Ocean region. Now, France is an Indian Ocean region state because of its majorly overseas territories of Mayotte and Reunion Island. In the post-colonial era, Reunion Island has become the base of France and Indian Ocean, and it has become and it has also been granted the state of overseas department of France. It is also the center of French strategic interest in Western Indian Ocean. It is the headquarter of French South Indian Ocean Armed Forces. People in Mayotte and Reunion Island they vote as French citizens for parliament election and send senators and deputies to the National Assembly. France also maintains a sizable force in Indian Ocean region with few maritime standing forces, surveillance frigates, patrol vessels, and maritime coastal patrol boat. French government justifies its military presence in the Indian Ocean region by giving two reasons. The first reason is that they want to secure maritime routes against piracy and other illegal activity. Secondly, they want they want because they know that there are several territorial disputes in the Indian Ocean region and they want and they require such forces. The other way through which we can cite. presence of france in indian ocean region is its relation with african island states in western indian ocean as per dr vidhan pathak france has a historical connect with most of the islands madagascar and comoros were its colonies mauritius and seychelles were occupied by france for a brief period and cultural presence of france can be cited in the term of use of french language in the office and school of madagascar mauritius both mauritius and seychelles are francophone and majority of the people speak french <coughs> madagascar intellectual elite have studied and acquired degree in french universities French is the principal language of Republic of Comoros. Now, just like India, France also has defence cooperation agreements with Comoros, Madagascar, and Mauritius. It has naval presence in the region and maintains presence of surveillance frigate to monitor region. It also patrols on major routes like Swiss Singapore Axis and Gulf of Cape Axis. France, similarly like India, France is also associated with regional institutions like Indian Ocean Rim Association, Indian Ocean Commission, and Indian Ocean Naval Symposium. Now coming up to the challenges in the region, the challenges in the region com comprises of uh, traditional as well as non-traditional threat, which is a very big threat to maritime security. Uh, as per one of the most comprehensive index by Open Maritime Security Index by Open Seas, most of the countries except Reunion and Mauritius are not able to enforce maritime security in the region, and that is because of the lack of ability and lack of resources to deal with illegal fishing, tra trafficking, piracy. the other challenges in the region constitutes a poor maritime domain awareness leading to creation of nexus of drugs trafficking and human trafficking 
maritime mixed migration is another challenge for Mayotte, which suffers from irregular migration on a, the traditional threat in the form of state actors is China. Most of the China funded projects around Indian Ocean are not sustainable investment as port are built far, built far larger than the current traffic demands. These projects may settle small economies of African island in Indian Ocean with huge debts to be repaid. The region is also vulnerable to climate change. Now, coming up to India-France partnership in Indian Ocean region, they have shared common value of democracy, rule of law, and individual liberty. Both India and France have signed strategic partnership in 1998. An important step forward was signing of bilateral maritime dialogue between India and France in 2015. In March 2018, the two countries also agreed to sign joint strategic vision of India-France cooperation in the Indian Ocean region, which highlights the shared challenges in the region, which is piracy, terrorism, respect of international law by all states, organized crime like trafficking, illegal fishing. Both sides reiterated their commitment to enhance cooperation in the Indian Ocean region and also expressed willingness to partner with other like-minded like countries in the form of trilateral dialogues. With respect to their partnership, uh, Dr. Isabella St. Mazard has highlighted the limitation of Indian-French partnership in the region, and that is mainly because of single-handedness of foreign policy leading to individual action. She mentions about missing link of comprehensive strategy on part of India and France in the region. She recommends both nations to enhance effective partnership in the region using program like UK Plester and EU Cremario, which is a maritime capacity building project. In the conclusion, I would like to reiterate what Dr. Isabella St. Mazard has recommended. Paris and New Delhi should have a regular dialogue on the Indian Ocean with a view to frame a shared strategic vision of the maritime challenges in the region and the policy responses accordingly. Incidentally, this will help to diversify the notion that arms exports primarily drive the French engagement with India. This will also help India to gain better understanding not only of French maritime vision, but also of EU's maritime security strategy. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Smriti. I think uh, you have really, uh, though I cut you short, but I think you really pinpointed the uh, the French interest and how they should improve. And that is precisely in the direction that they are working. So I'm glad that, you know, uh, I would suggest that you can continue to watch the developments which are taking place. Um, and then accordingly, you can work on your research. Uh, particularly now, India's also interest in uh, Madagascar, in Seychelles, in Mauritius, as to are they going to be complementary to each other or are they going to be divergence with each other? And is there likely to be a collaboration or there is likely to be a sort of divergence? So this you may like to keep it as a sort of a, one more, uh, shall I say, two, three paragraphs on that. So that the, the when you submit your uh, uh, papers wherever, they know that you have taken many aspects on their account. Don't spend too much time on that, but very little time uh, so that, you know, it becomes a little more comprehensive. Uh, that takes me to invite uh, Dr. Pushkumar Gayasen. Uh, the assistant professor at the Department of Political Science at uh, Munger University in JMS College. And he will be talking to us, India and the Indo-Pacific region, perception, interest, and strategy. Uh, Dr. Saab, shall I ask you to um, sort of really keep it very compressed, uh, five to seven minutes maximum, because we're really running out of time. Go ahead, all yours. <clears throat> yeah, thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll keep it short. Uh, I'd like to share my screen. Uh, I hope my screen is visible. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, as the topic suggests, yeah, as the topic suggests, India in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, perceptions, interests, and strategies. So, what I would like to do here is uh, uh, basically try to examine the evolving patterns of India's might and doctrines and strategies documents and other initiatives of the Indian Navy in the Indo-Pacific region. So in general, the paper basically inquires into India's overall perceptions, interests, strategies vis-a-vis -vis the Indian Indo-Pacific region. So if you look at the map, I think it's very important to remember the locations because there will be a few terms which uh, will come again and again when it comes to Indo-Pacific region because it's basically the amalgamation of two major oceans, that is Indian Ocean and, and, and therefore, this ocean, which is one of the most vital regions, is 
we see over decades an aspiration to become a maritime power which has been coupled with economic growth and the need to counter traditional non-traditional security threats for example china's uh, assertive uh, presence and of course piracy and other issues talking about china the china aspires to uh, dominate the sea waters and control the major sea lanes and ports in the indo pacific so we see that india is also responding in various ways hypothetically the recent enunciation of india's maritime doctrines which underlines the evolving role of the indian navy as a guardian to protect the indian maritime interests in the far away regions from its shores so in this paper we will be seeing that development we can say though it's not new anymore it's been almost two decades now that india has been coming up with its maritime doctrines which has which has never happened before so we see a from political end also and then the navy in the navy also is they are all sort of conceptualizing india's maritime interest maritime strategies for the indo pacific region so talking about that political end we have seen that recently that uh, ministry of external affairs that just just shankar that he talks about india pacific is one of the new concepts and approaches which thrown up by the changing world so it has been accepted though is imaginative but it has been very very much at the center of strategic discourse here in india so much so that that during uh, shangri la last summit in 2018 prime minister modi even spoke about that indo pacific is about its a shared future so he has also stressed that the need for safeguarding freedom of navigation and stability of indo pacific must be taken into account so what exactly india's vision is it's basically open integrated and balanced that's what india talks about so open means absence of any hegemonic power be it chinese really maybe now which is very dominant earlier it used to be the us presence which is no longer a threat to india because we are already there with quad and all india also wanted to be integrated that means that there should not be so many poles there should not be polarities there should be some integrated approach where countries work together and then harness their interest. similarly it should be balanced multipolar world and multipolar asia india sees it that way so there should not be any hegemony in the region so we can see that how this ocean is important this big pacific our indo pacific there are so many choke points there are so many sea lanes of communications which makes it really really important for india so what india wants exactly india wants peace and security in the region geopolitical aspirations of course it has like any other country on very importantly countering china so ensuring that china does not gain a significant role in the region india is also gearing up. enhancing trade and investment cooperation india favors sustainable development of the region promoting sustainable development it blue economy through active policy aligning with asean and also other countries like india asia japan republic of korea australia new zealand so what we see a lot of new developments taking place but one important factor we cannot ignore that is china factor so as far as india sees china i mean this post spot border dispute or uh, beat maritime dispute maritime region india has been really be cautious and even its defense ministers time and again they have been talking about political leaders have again and again pointed about that how china is important and so what indian navy does think so so what has brought china into the indo pacific be it economic trade issues to protect the sea lanes of communication so it has legitimate regions at the same time it's it's, uh, it's called also a revisiting power it's not a status quo power which means that it will be asserting itself it will be having ambitions to become a maritime power in the region so in china will be bullying in future that's the way it is being perceived we can see chinese footprints in the indian ocean region so no no longer the case that that china is constrained to south china sea we can see it all over the indian ocean or that is the west pacific ocean as well when it comes to india's maritime tradition india has had a very rich maritime tradition so before coming to maritime enunciations or repeated maritime doctrines india already had maritime past but during that uh, uh, few phases we see that during medieval age or the british age that we see somehow it was fading away but again cold war post in the cold war era we see that india is coming up with maritime uh, visions particularly particularly after the post cold war era we see that india has once again given importance to maritime and we see that there are security concerns which are identified beach health and energy security traditional non traditional threats security of vital choke points rising chinese naval presence so what india does indian navy's rising profile and repeated articulations 
So new outward approach, rapid economic growth as catalyst to expansion of Indian Navy, increased defense budget allocation, significant growth in the Indian Navy structure and stature, the Navy places significant emphasis on choke points. So that's what India has done, repeated enunciation of India's maritime articulation, which was not before 1998 or particularly 2004. It has never ever happened that India came up with any doctrine that was 2004, India's maritime doctrine document. Again, India comes up with India's Navy's vision document, freedom to use the sea, India's maritime strategy document, India's maritime doctrine document, 2005 again, 15 again, revised doctrine document. So what does it indicate? It simply indicates that India is trying to simply show its presence, strategize, bring out doctrines, and so that it can have a long-term vision about Indo-Pacific and Indo-Ocean. So India's maritime strategy documents, they define primary areas of interest. We can see all these regions, Caribbean Sea, Bay of Bengal, island territories, choke points, island countries, Persian Gulf, all these things suggest that India is identifying those areas where India would like to be there in future. So secondary area of interest we have seen in earlier drag doctrines, Red Sea, South China Sea and all. Rising importance of Indian Navy's stern command we have seen. India's Navy, Indian Navy's military assistance during, during to some foreign tsunami we have seen. What has changed recently? So this would be my uh, last few slides. So what has changed in 2015, again, that Indian Navy is leading the military effort in realizing India's in the past. 2016, that Indian Navy released that Indian military document, doc, doctrine 2015, which is just a revision of 2019. So what has changed? The latest enunciation pertains to the reconfiguration of primary and secondary areas of interest. The enlargement of India's areas of maritime interest southeast towards and westwards in the ocean. Southeast Indian Ocean, including sea routes to the Pacific Ocean, Littoral regions, Mediterranean Sea, littoral regions, the west coast of Africa. So from Africa to we see that entire West Pacific Ocean, India is identifying its areas of interest. So originally in 2019, we have not seen that the same littoral regions of Australia and Africa as uh, primary areas. Those were secondary areas of interest. Now it has become primary area of, area of interest. Similarly, Southwest Indian Ocean and Red Sea, which was earlier considered as secondary areas, now encompasses within the primary areas. Persian Gulf has become, again, very important choke points for India, indicating that it is considered more crucial for India's interest, as we can see in the map. So, so Dr. Kush, so I will request What you we to... can see in the same sure. Yeah, so can, you, can you just bring it to halt yes, sir. very yeah, quickly? Including it. Yes, sir, it's, uh, it's almost done, sir. So, in conclusion, India, Indo-Pacific is a strategic space. Repeated enunciation, enunciation of course, is a result of <laughs> India's overall growing capabilities as well as the growing maritime assertiveness of China in the region. So in the light of aggression of China, India has been focusing on strengthening maritime prowess, which to further strengthen its position larger in the Pacific region. So what India needs to do, revisit the ASEAN relations. Also, consider it again that SARC, BIMSTEC, or Mekong Bingo Cooperation and such platforms as again revitalize and giving important significance. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kush. I think you and I will have a very separate uh... Uh, you know, we can discuss this for two, three days because it's a subject which is very close to my heart. Uh, but I think we will really discuss and we'll get in touch with each other. And that brings me to the paper six. I think putting six papers in one and a half hours is a little bit criminal. Um, and very, uh, we're not giving enough time to our researchers to, you know, put up their papers. But I'm sure that the next chair will probably bear with me if we barge into his time by four or five minutes. Uh, the last one is by uh, Gitanjali Sinaroa. A research assistant from uh, uh, from my institution, the United Services Institution, the changing dynamics of the Indo-Pacific, uh, paving the way for network of networks. Gitanjali ji, all yours. Uh, sir, uh, she is not here in the meet. She could oh, not okay. join us. Okay, so, so that yeah. that brings to end. Okay, now and, what I'll do is you know taking questions and answers. I can take just two questions if there are. Please address it to me directly and uh, we'll try. Or maybe you can address it to me and I'll ask the researchers to make a, a short reply on that. Yeah, floor is open for question and answer. If you feel you have a question, please raise your hand. Or you can share your questions in the chat box too. Tanya has raised her hand. Tanya, okay. Uh, hello, am Tanya. I visible? Yes, you are. Go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, my question, one question is uh, to Smriti Shukla. 
Uh, I wanted to ask you, ma'am, that you talked about Indo-Pacific. So uh, I want you to put some light on the fact that how is AUKUS, the development of AUKUS is going to affect India-France uh, relations. And my next question is for uh, Kush, sir. Uh, sir, it was really nice listening to you, but I wanted to ask you that uh, you what you call as China factor or uh, assertiveness of China. So where do you find acknowledgement of this China factor in the behavior of other state, other state actors other than India who really have a considerable stake in the Indo-Pacific? So I would like to know these two questions. Smriti ji, you shoot off first. Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, my topic was not Indo-Pacific specifically, it was Indian Ocean, but still I would like to address your question. Uh, as you said that how come AUKUS will affect India and France relation, we have seen this thing very clearly and it has been made out very clearly in newspapers also, that France was not happy with the AUKUS because of not being able to participate in AUKUS. Similarly, and when it comes to India, India is not interested in all of the, in being part of all of the US or UK initiatives. India is already participating in Quad, and therefore there has not been any severe reaction from India. The topic that I was dealing with was to focus more on India and France coming up together and forming alliances and forming minilaterals, like one initiative like International <coughs> Solar Alliances. So similarly, they can also come together and form a trilateral in the region so as to have a stable region in the Indian Ocean. Okay, thank you. I think that's it. Uh, the next question was addressed to I think it was a very general question. So anyone, uh, yeah, Kush, sir, Kush, Kush, sir, Dr. Kush. Yes. Dr. Kush, you can take on that. Yeah. Briefly, in one, um, we want to thank you for the question. We do see that China considered as a country, for example, that we would call as a factory in the Indo Pacific region. Australia now, that office we have seen now already, right? How Australia, England, and then uh, US, they are all grouping together. We can see quite the best example, right? So of course, China is being factored there, by particularly by US. So in that way, apart from China, these are the countries you can see that they're factoring China in the capacity. Thank you. I think that's a very short and sweet answer. Well, coming back to one of the points which uh, Smriti ji made, uh, you know, the one of the main reasons of uh, France getting annoyed with the AUKUS was uh, its own, uh, you know, it's more of commercial really, because the submarine purchases which were supposed to be done from France by Australia, uh, you know, that has been sort of uh, put on the back burner. And now that money will be utilized for the nuclear submarines. Uh, having said that, uh, the question was that how does it impact the Indo-French uh, relationship? Well, it has, it has already, uh, you have seen as a reaction, the day it happened, the, the president of uh, France, Mr. Macron, uh, he made a telephonic conversation with uh, Prime Minister Modi. And uh, no details are known, but I, suggest, I, I guess um, that the Prime Minister Modi would have uh, showed him that, you know, the value of France does not reduce. And I'm sure in, uh, in the coming days, the, even the commercial part will probably get uh, looked after. And within two, three days, the France and India uh, you know, signed the two plus two arrangement, uh, which is the ministerial level, both the defense and the foreign ministers uh, meet together with the, their counterparts. And this is the highest body other than the summit meeting, which happens between two heads of state. So I think that, uh, uh, you know, we will see uh, more of even commercial uh, dealings, particularly in the defense sector, uh, it immediately resulted in the in the French government signing an agreement with uh, India, uh, you know, for uh, starting to co-develop the uh, gas turbine engine technology. Uh, the company called Saffron is now going to be working with the Indian company, uh, you know, in 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 the our uh, Atmanirbhar uh, sort of uh, project and Atmanirbhar uh, future, uh, and that is likely to be a very game changer for the. Uh, for India because we are quite weak in gas turbine technology. So I'll put a stop here. I would like to uh, thank all the all the panelists and uh, compliment them for very high quality paper. Uh, you know, being a practitioner of uh, you know Indo Pacific, I found that they were really really very incisive. And I'll be happy if uh, uh, you know if if I can get the 
copies of their talk and give my email address to them if there is anything to interact with me and if i can be of any any assistance in in furtherance of their research i'll be happy to do that so thank you very much uh, janki devi memorial college for inviting me and giving me opportunity to chair such a brilliant uh, panel thank you very much jain thank you sir uh, with this i would like to extend word of thanks to uh, vice admiral shekhar sinha sir for accepting the invitation and uh, uh conducting this session so smoothly and uh, bringing in uh, his uh, perspective which which was quite uh, uh, eye opening for all the presenters here thank you all the paper presenters and last but not the least all the audience who made this uh, session quite a success thank you thank you everyone thank you sir Okay with this